Good evening. Let's open tonight's service with hymn number uh, 442 from the hardback hymnal, 442. Praise him, praise him. Let's all stand together, number 442. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O oh, earth, his wonderful love proclaim. Hail him, hail him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. In his arms he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins he suffered and bled and died. He, our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail him, hail him, Jesus the crucified. Sound his praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows. Love unbounded, wonderful, deep, and strong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Please be seated. How we hope the Lord will enable us to praise him tonight. Will you open your Bibles with me to Psalm 24? <clears throat> and we'll read for our call to worship the first 10 verses of Psalm 25. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. Show me thy ways, O Lord, and teach me thy paths. This is a great call to worship. <laughs> Lord, show us Christ. He's the way. Enable us to walk after him. Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindnesses, for they have been ever of old. That loving kindnesses is the Old Testament word for grace. And uh, David's asking the Lord for mercy and grace 
Mercy, withhold from me that which I deserve. Grace, give to me that which I can never earn. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to thy mercy, remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. We need to be careful when we speak, don't we? <laughs> I was uh, with a religious guy recently, and, and uh, he found out I enjoy smoking cigars occasionally, and he had a group of men that met on a regular basis that were uh, Christian men that got together and enjoyed a cigar. And uh, he called their group Holy Smokes. That's blasphemous. It really is. You know, when, when, uh, when the Lord says, for thy goodness sake, <laughs> you know, we say, for well, goodness sake. No, it's for Christ's sake. He's the only one that's good. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, will he teach sinners in the way. The meek will he guide in judgment. And the meek will he teach his way. Lord, make us meek. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity. For it is great. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful that you have given us words to express to you words that are pleasing in thy sight. And Lord, we join our voice with our brother David. Lord, our, our iniquities are great. Oh, how much we're in need of your mercy and of your grace. And we know, Lord, that if you do it for us, it'll be for your goodness sake. Lord, we pray that for, for Christ's sake, you'd be pleased now to meet with your people, fulfill your promise to inhabit the praise of your people. Lord, speak to our hearts, teach us, as we've just asked you in this psalm, Lord, teach us, teach us of Christ. Lord, it's in his name we pray. Amen. Number 256, 256. Let's all stand together again. It is. 
every time we sing it. I can just see Mr. Spafford walking the decks of that ship, grieving the loss of his children and pinning the words to that hymn. I think, Lord, give me that kind of grace. <clears throat> we open your Bibles with me again to Psalm 24. This is the Psalm of the Ascension. Psalm 22, Psalm 23, and Psalm 24 go together. Psalm 22 is the Psalm of the Cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then all the details that are expressed in Psalm 22 about the sufferings of Christ on Calvary's cross. Psalm 23 speaks to the grave and the resurrection. As the Lord Jesus Christ is praying to his Father, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. It was the Lord, it pleased God to bruise him and then he restoreth my soul. That's primarily speaking of the resurrection. That's when the Lord was restored. When God Almighty would not allow his Holy One to see corruption, raised him from the dead victorious over the grave. And now Psalm 24 speaks of the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. As it says, lift up. Your heads, verse 9, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors. The king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord, the Lord, the Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. So this psalm is about the ascension. 
Everything that the Lord Jesus Christ did was necessary for our salvation. His incarnation, his virgin birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. I want us to look at this psalm and ask this question, what is the significance of the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ? There's no salvation without it. When we speak of the cross as being everything, it is the pinnacle of everything that the Lord Jesus Christ did. But everything leading up to the cross and everything after the cross was equally necessary for our salvation as was what he accomplished on the cross. Without, without his sinless life, the cross would have meant nothing. Without his resurrection, the cross would have meant nothing. Without the ascension, the cross would have been ineffectual. And so this psalm speaks of the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember in John chapter 20 when uh, the scripture says that Mary Magdalene, of whom the Lord cast out seven demons, she got to the tomb on that resurrection morning before anybody else. She was all by herself. I'm sure she showed up before sunrise. The Lord had just come out of the tomb. And she mistook him for a gardener. She saw that the tomb was empty. And she thought that the Lord was the gardener. And the Lord said to her, he said, woman, why weepest thou? And she said to him, she said, sir, she said, if you've taken his body, please tell me where it is and I'll get it and take care of it. And then the Lord said, Mary, oh, she knew that voice. <laughs> it was beyond her imagination that it was the Lord. And she fell at his feet and cried, Rabboni, Master. She clinged to him. And he said to her, he said, Mary, don't touch me. Or touch me not. He said, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Now, we know that the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ took place several weeks later. And that the disciples touched the Lord physically before he ascended into heaven. But what was he saying to Mary? Was he saying to Mary, don't touch me, you will defile me before I ascend to my father? Or was he saying to Mary, Mary, it's okay. I'm not going to leave you yet. I'm going to explain all of this to you. <laughs> it's going to be some time between now and the time I ascend to my father. And, uh, and I'll, I'll make sense of all of this for you. But you go back to the disciples and tell them that I go to my father and to your father, to my God and to your God. <laughs> that will be a message of hope for them. Not only have I raised from the dead, but I'm ascending back into glory. <laughs> and I'm taking with me the names of those for whom I've lived and died. And I'm going to be your intercessor before the father. You go back and tell the disciples that. The Lord wasn't saying to Mary, don't touch me, you'll defile me. He invited Thomas, you remember, to put his hands into his side and touch his hand, you know, his, his wounds. Um, he ate with the disciples. No, he was saying to her, Mary, the ascension's still a little ways away, and I'm going to be here with you, and I've got something very important I need you to do right now. Go tell the disciples that I'm going, that I'm going before them as their forerunner to their father, to my father, to their God, and to my God. <clears throat> you see, without the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ, there would be no hope of salvation. 
Turn with me before we read Psalm 24. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 6. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 6. <clears throat> Look at verse 18. That by two immutable things, two things that it is impossible to change, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to take hold upon the hope that is set before us. <laughs> And that's what we're taking hold of. We're like Mary at the, at the tomb. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the precious things about the Lord's grace is, is that Mary, of, of all the people that the Lord saved, um, I mean, her life was seven demons. What kind, of, what kind of life did she have before she met Christ? And yet the Lord revealed himself first to her. <clears throat> we lay hold of the hope, just like Mary laid hold of the hope, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. <laughs> Mary, you go tell the disciples that I'm going to ascend to my father and to their father, to my God and to their God. My ascension is going to be essential for their hope and which entereth into that within the veil whither the forerunner is for us entered even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek so this is our hope the Lord Jesus Christ went into the veil he went into the holies of holies he, 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 he shed his precious blood, put it on the mercy seat, and now he says, I'm your forerunner. I'm going before you. You see, without the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ, we would have no hope that there's a place prepared for us. Isn't that what the Lord said in John chapter 14? He said, uh, let not your heart be troubled. We'd be troubled. We'd have no hope. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. I go and prepare a place for you. Now what did the Lord have to do to prepare a place for us? Present himself before God as a successful Savior. <clears throat> go back with me to our, uh, <clears throat> to our text. <clears throat> Everything... This psalm starts out, before it gets to the, to the truth of the ascension, it starts out by making this clear declaration. Everything and everyone in this world belongs to the Lord. And he will do with it whatsoever he wills. Look at, look at, the earth is the Lord's and uh, the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Everyone belongs to him. He reigns over the living and over the dead. And in Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure, for thy pleasure, they are and were created. No, everything is for his pleasure. Now man in his pride believes that he's got control over the destiny of his own, of his own life. Turn with me to Daniel chapter, <coughs> Daniel <coughs> chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar. Is such a, a clear picture of the natural man <clears throat> and the opinion that he has of himself. 
people, people don't deny that the Lord Jesus Christ ascended into glory any more than they deny that he rose from the dead or that he died on a Roman cross or that he lived a sinless life or that, that he performed the miracles that he did perform or that he was born of a virgin and conceived of the Holy Spirit. They, 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 they confess their faith in those facts. Believing the gospel is not believing what happened, it is believing why it happened, why it happened. And all those people who will, who will gladly confess uh, their faith in the events of Christ have no idea why he did what he did. What is the ascension all about? Well, this psalm begins by making it clear that the Lord owns everything and everyone. And Nebuchadnezzar is such a, is such a clear picture <clears throat> of, uh, of the natural man. Look at, uh, look at verse 29. <coughs> <coughs> and at the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. And the king spake and said... Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Now that's exactly what the natural, you know, the people who say they believe in Jesus. They're, they're trusting in a decision that they made. They're trusting in a work that they performed. They're trusting in something other than the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation. And so they, 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 they're just like Nebuchadnezzar. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from thee. And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. And they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he wills. <laughs> God gives. Salvation belongs to the Lord. It's his salvation. He's the one who determines who will be saved, how they will be saved, when they will be saved. The same hour was this thing fulfilled in Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till the hairs of his head grew like eagle's feathers. <clears throat> And his nails like bird's claws. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes unto heaven, and my understanding returned unto me. <laughs> and see, we were just the same way. The Lord had to turn our eyes toward heaven and cause our understanding to return unto us. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever whose dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? <laughs> He's the potter, we are all the clay, he will make some vessels of honor and some of dishonor. And at the same time, my reason returned unto me. <clears throat> All men are in need of their reason to return unto them before, before they're going to bow and say, with David, go back with me to our text and say with David, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord? 
How can a man be right with God? Who's going to stand in the presence of a holy God? <laughs> he, he's the one who owns everything. And he's the one who's going to decide who's going to be able to stand in his presence. Who shall stand in his holy place? And he answers the question, he that hath clean hands, never has his hands been involved in doing any work that wasn't God's work. And a pure heart, <laughs> he loved the Lord God with all of his heart, all of his mind, and all of his soul all the time. We can't find a moment in our lives where we can say we've done that. And God says, I own all of this. Who's going to be able to come into my presence? I'll tell you who. That one whose hands are clean. The one whose heart is pure. The one who has never lifted up his soul unto vanity nor sworn deceitfully now <clears throat> the verbs in these verses are in the perfect tense and that just simply means that it is a completed action it's very similar go back with me to uh, Psalm 15 you remember Psalm 15 This is the same question that David asked in Psalm 15. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. You remember? Those were active participles, which means that they were continual actions, unbroken actions. All those things had to be done all the time. Who's going to be able to stand in his presence? Verse 5, Psalm 24. The one who fits the qualifications of verse 4 shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Now turn to me to 1 John chapter 3. <clears throat> Verse 7 Little children Let no man deceive you He that doeth righteousness Is righteous Even as he is righteous He that committeth sin Is of the devil for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested. This is why the Lord Jesus Christ came into the world to destroy the works of the devil. To put away sin. So that whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin because he's born of God. What is the Lord saying? <laughs> he that sanctifieth. That word means he that makes you holy. And he that is sanctified, they that are made holy, are all as one. So that he's not ashamed to call us his brethren. 
as he is, so are we. Union with Christ, the only hope that we have of being able to stand in the presence of God is to be found in him, not having our own righteousness, which is of the law, but that righteousness, which is by the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the gospel. If this, if this isn't true, what hope do we have? How are we going to stand in his presence? How are we going to? He, he owns everything and he knows everything. He sees, he sees our thoughts. He, he knows our words before we speak them. And he knows that all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. If, if the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't stand in our stead and, and, and intercede on our behalf, that's why he said, little children, I write unto you that you sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. <coughs> Go back with me. <clears throat> Why is the ascension necessary for our salvation? <clears throat> Do you remember when the Lord <coughs> spoke to us and said that it was necessary that he go away? For if he go not away, the comforter would not come. And, but when the Comforter comes, he's going to do three things. He's going to convict the world of sin, because they believe not on me, of righteousness, because I go to my Father. If the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't ascend back into heaven, we don't have a righteous advocate. We don't have a priest. We don't have one to plead our case to stand up for us. You know, the Lord, the Lord generally is seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. How many times do we read of that in the scriptures? The hope that we have is that all the blessings of God are in the heavenlies, in Christ right now. That's what Psalm 24 is all about. Who's going to be able to come into the presence of God? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart has never lifted up his soul to vanity nor spoken deceitfully. He's, he's the one who's going to be our righteousness. But if he doesn't go back to the Father, we don't have a righteous advocate. You see, the ascension is just as necessary for our salvation as was the cross. It, the <clears throat> Secondly, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 7. <clears throat> Verse 25. Verse 24, but this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. <laughs> Not like those Old Testament priests, they died. We have a priest who ever lives, wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for us. So if the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't ascend back into glory, we don't have a righteous advocate to make intercession on our behalf. We don't have a priest. Now the Lord Jesus Christ, as our priest, presents himself. He's the Lamb of God. He presents himself. He's the sacrifice. He's not just the, the priest that offers a sacrifice. He's offering himself. What did, what, did, what did Abraham say to Isaac? When Isaac asked him, Father, here's the wood and here's the fire. Where is the lamb? Where is the sacrifice? And what did Abraham say? Son, God will provide himself a sacrifice. 
God did the providing. He provided it to himself and he provided himself. And so we have a priest now who's not just a priest, but he is the lamb as well. He's the sacrifice presenting himself on our behalf. If, if there's no ascension, we have no advocate. We have no hope. <clears throat> we wouldn't have the Holy Spirit if it wasn't for the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. We would only have his presence physically. Mary, she, she didn't want to leave him, did she? She was clinging to him. <laughs> and what did the Lord say? It's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Spirit, the Comforter, he won't come. And on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came, the full power of God, so that from that day to this day, every child of God, has access to the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God 24-7. You wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and something's heavy on your soul and you can turn to Christ and he doesn't sleep nor slumber. <laughs> He's there. You're driving to work and you can talk to him. He's there. He's here. He's where, wherever. We have the Spirit of God. And what is, the, what is the ministry of the Spirit of God? To point us to Him. The Holy Spirit doesn't call attention to Himself. The Holy Spirit points us to Christ. So without the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ, we wouldn't have the Spirit of God. And without the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ, we would have reason to fear that heaven was not yet prepared for us. He said, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. If it were not so, I would have told you. You see, without the ascension of Christ, there would be no second coming. He came to redeem. He ascended back into glory to intercede. And he's coming again to establish Israel once and for all. You remember in Acts chapter 1 when <clears throat> the disciples are with the Lord on the Mount of Olives and they knew that something was about to happen. I mean, their, their lives had been turned upside down. They'd seen so many amazing things that they knew something significant was about. They were all there, all back on the Mount of Olives. So they asked the Lord, is it time now? <laughs> is it time now for you to establish the kingdom of Israel? And what did the Lord say to them? It's not for you to know the time of the season. But you go back into Jerusalem and you wait and the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the world. And immediately he was caught up into the clouds. Ascended back to the Father. And they stood there gazing up into heaven. <laughs> and two men in white apparel, two angels appeared unto them. And they said, men of Galilee, why stand you here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which has been taken up from you, is going to come again in like manner. <laughs> you see, without the ascension, there's no hope for a second coming. And the establishment of the kingdom of God for all eternity. The ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ is essential for our salvation. And how glorious it is for us to know where he is and when he's coming again. So now in Psalm 24, let's go back <clears throat> to our text. Who's going to stand in God's presence? He owns everything. That's how this psalm starts out. He owns every person and everything, and he will do with it whatsoever he wills. The armies of heaven and all the inhabitants of the earth, 
And only men like Nebuchadnezzar in their pride think that they've got control. And when our senses return unto us, we realize that the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does whatsoever he wills. <clears throat> so who's going to, if that's true, if verses 1 and 2 are true, then who's going to be able to stand in God's presence? Those who are perfect. Those who are found in him. He, the Lord Jesus Christ, shall receive the blessing of God and righteousness from the God of his salvation to give salvation to whomsoever he wills. Now, not what it says in John chapter 17? God has given him power over all flesh. This is the generation of them that seek him that seek thy face. And the better translation of those last two words is, O God of Jacob. O God of Jacob. Lord, I'm just a Jacob. I, I, need, a, I, need, I need you to be my God. <clears throat> Lift up your heads, O ye gates. <laughs> and the Lord speaking to the very gates of heaven. You're going to say, lift up your heads? Oh, you're going to stand in the, on the, at the gates of heaven and say, open up. <laughs> open up. No, but he can. And he did. Open up. I'm coming back. Lift up your gates. Lift up your heads, O oh, ye gates. And be lifted up, ye everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. He's the only one the gates are going to be open for. Now how do I know if I'm in him? Because I have no strength. I have no might. I have no ability to open the gates of heaven. The only way I'm going to get into heaven is if he opens the gates for me and I go in with him. If, I'm, if I go in with him, if he died for me, if he died for me, then I went in with him. You see, when he ascended, we ascended. We're in Christ. All of God's people are in Christ right now. Who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. We know something about battle. We fight our flesh every day, don't we? The flesh wars against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. We're not able to be what we ought to be. And the Lord said, I fought that battle too. And as often as you lose that battle, I won it. <laughs> I won it. Comfort ye, comfort ye, Jerusalem. Speak ye comfortably unto them. Tell them their warfare is accomplished. Tell them the mighty one of Israel has gone to battle on their behalf. Tell them David has slayed Goliath, defeated the devil. That's what we just read in 1 John chapter 3. What did he come for? What did the Son of Man come for? To destroy the works of the devil. To put away sin. To deliver his people from the gates of hell and to bring them in with him through the gates of glory. That's what he said. He said that the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it. You see, we were just like Nebuchadnezzar. We were held captive in unbelief and darkness, unable to save ourselves, unable to open the gates of heaven. And the Lord comes and he brings us out of one kingdom and translates us into another kingdom. Lift up your heads. O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. <laughs> He's not going to try to come in. He's not going to make an attempt to come in. Oh, no. He shall come in. These gates, when they saw him coming, they opened up. They opened, Just like those clouds opened up and he was caught up into heaven. He was received back into glory and everyone he lived and died for were received back into glory with him.
Who is, the king, who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. What is the host? Well, it's the armies of heaven and all the inhabitants of the earth. <laughs> He's Lord over all. How do I know that I, that I went with him into, because I'm able to bow to him as the king of glory? He gets all the glory for my salvation. And he is Lord. And he'll do what's right. The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. There is a huge difference between a message of salvation where the Lord Jesus Christ gets all the glory and one that gives man some of the glory. What is my hope? That when he ascended back into glory, my name was in the Lamb's book of life. What is my hope that he, that he intercedes for me right now? I believe that he gets all the glory. All the glory. He did it all. <laughs> He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He's the King of glory. <laughs> and, and we don't want to rob him of any of his glory, do we? God forbid that we should call him into question or that we should think that we've got something to contribute to his finished work of redemption. We have an advocate with the Father. The gates have been opened and he was received back into glory. Our merciful Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your word and oh how we ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would cause us to, to rest, to believe, to meditate on the hope of knowing that we have a high priest, a forerunner, an advocate, the Lord of glory, of whom the gates were opened. Lord, that uh, we have acceptance before thee in him. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. 143. Let's stand together. <clears throat> Rejoice the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Rejoice, give thanks and sing and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say rejoice. Jesus the Savior reigns, the God of truth and love. When he had purged our stains, he took his seat above. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say rejoice. His kingdom cannot fail, he rules o'er earth and heaven. The keys of death and hell are to our Jesus given. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say rejoice. Rejoice in 
in glorious hope, our Lord the Judge shall come and take his servants up to their eternal. 